We're thrilled to learn from Troy Moon from the city of Portland and Julie Rosenbach from the city of South Portland. My name is Will Sedlak uh, and I'm the Civic Engagement, I'm Maine Conservation Voters Civic Engagement Manager. My job is to help Mainers from across the state make our voices heard in the political process so we can protect our common home and future. Maine Conservation's mission is to cultivate and use political power to conserve and protect Maine's environment. MCV helps pass laws that protect our environmental legacy, elects pro-environment candidates to office, and holds our elected officials accountable without regard to political party. Our agenda for today, if you want to switch over to that, Troy. Uh, a few technical notes first. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. Please send your questions to me, Will, as they occur to you through the chat function below, which you can find by hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen and clicking where it says chat. I'll keep track of the questions and ask Julie and Troy your questions during the Q&A after the presentation. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, along with recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learn. So we hope you check those out. If you have any technical difficulties, please message Kathleen Meal through the chat function for help. Again, thank you all for joining us and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Troy and Julie. Great. Oops, we, uh, we got, oops. Uh-oh, sorry, technical difficulty. That's okay. <laughs> I got the wrong one, okay. There we go. So do you wanna jump off, Julie? Absolutely, I'd love to, to kick it off. Um, thanks, Will, for having us here today. I'm, I'm really excited to um, share with you information about our One Climate Future uh, Plan. Um, and just to give you the context, it was in 2018 when Portland and South Portland um, started discussing and joined together to develop um, one common regional um, climate action and adaptation plan for both of our cities. Next slide. Uh, this is because both of our city councilors in 2018 adopted two really ambitious climate goals. The first to reduce citywide greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, and the second was to use 100% clean renewable energy uh, for municipal operations by 2040. Next slide. So those were adopted in 2018. In October of last year, um, the uh, youth around the country held a youth climate strike um, and asked both of our city councils to adopt a resolution declaring climate change an emergency. Um, our councils did and they um, and we supported their action um, and we talked to our city councilors and said, well, we're in the midst of developing our climate action plans and so we don't wanna blow up our goal of 80% um, reductions by 2050, um, but we agree that we can do more. And so um, we are pursuing our original goal and then um, developing um, um, more aggressive actions for um, uh, accelerating our reduction pathway by 2030. So how can we reduce our overall emissions 80% by 2050, but with um, accelerated reductions by 2030? So today um, we're gonna talk about our, how we developed, how we worked together to develop our One Climate Future Plan, how we're planning on meeting our goals. But before that, I just wanna talk a little bit, uh, Troy and I, about the, um, the context, the hazards and the impacts of climate change. Uh, starting with this slide on you know, why, I, I, I feel a little like I might be speaking to the choir, but why climate um, um, action is warranted immediately and urgently. Um, so what this is showing us is that um, the uh, cumulative uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, in the world, and the context is that 30 years ago, in 1988, NASA scientist James Hansen testified to Congress that the age of climate change had arrived. 1988. Since that time, we have added more carbon into the atmosphere than in all other times combined. So that sort of sets the stage for, um, you know, our planning, you know, for you know, what we're up against um, with our climate action plans that, um, you know, emissions, carbon emissions globally um, have continued to rise uh, and accelerate um, globally. So that kind of complicates our, our planning process a little bit because we kind of have to think about 
you know, what, what are things going to look like in the future? And so the IPCC has um, been working with different models over the years and a lot of different communities have, um, have looked at that work and trying to decide, you know, which scenario do we use to, um, to plan for the future in our community. So the first, uh, you know, the most, one of the more common um, scenarios that people look at is a low emission scenario. This is kind of in line with the Paris Climate Accords and it suggests that we all act kind of immediately, reduce emissions um, dramatically in the short term, and that will keep us to a global temperature rise of around two degrees C. Um, so far, we haven't seen um, that happening. We haven't seen a lot of action that would suggest that that's going to happen. We hope it will. We hope that climate action will, um, will ramp up. Um, but from a planning, you know, for, from a you know, civic planning perspective, um, we have to be a little more cautious than that. So we've kind of built our planning scenarios around RCP 4.5, which is kind of our intermediate um, scenario, which suggests that we'll, we can reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And then maybe after that, we can use some carbon sequestration technologies and, and start sucking carbon out of the air. And that leads to um, a sea level up global temperature of, you know, between two and 3.6 degrees C by 2100. And that's, you know, that's a pretty drastic change to the environment and the climate that we're used to today. But if um, we kind of continue on the business as usual, emissions continue uh, upward on the graph that um, Julie just mentioned, um, we look, we would see temperatures of between three and five and a half degrees C by 2100. And that's certainly not um, a planet that anyone's familiar with. Humans have never existed in the type of climate that would suggest. So that's what we're really trying really hard to avoid. Um, because there's certainly a lot of consequences associated with, with those types of uh, climate change scenarios. The first one kind of, you know, being in Portland, we're really concerned about um, sea level rise. It's the most obvious thing we're on the, we're on the coast. Um, so what, what would some of those scenarios mean for us um, in Portland? And if you look at the top graph, we're kind of currently at the intersection where all the colored lines are starting to diverge. And you can see um, the dramatic difference uh, between um, near term climate action and if we delay our action. You can see the green line is the uh, 2.6 scenario, the kind of two, point, the two degrees C climate Paris cord um, line. And that's you know showing that we might see you know up to one and a half meters of sea level rise by 2100. But um, if we you know again continue on our bad our bad path, you know we're going to see over two and a half meters of sea level rise potentially. And if we put that kind of into the local context, um, we've you know the analysis we're suggest or looked at suggests that you know we should it would be wise for us to you know commit to manage that intermediate sea level rise scenario, which is about, you know, a little less than, this is in feet, the bottom, the bottom one's in feet, not meters, sorry for the confusion. But we could see, you know, two, two feet of sea level rise by 2050 and you know, over four um, by 2100. And that's, again, if we take some amount of action to reduce emissions by 20, you know, to eliminate emissions by 2050. But again, if we don't take action, we could see over 11 feet of sea level rise by, by 2100. Um, and just to, what does that look like? So here's the intermediate scenario. And you can see that a lot of the things that we like um, in Portland and South Portland are underwater, inundated um, daily by, by rising seas um, at the intermediate scenario. So we certainly will have problems. And I'm not sure if you can see the top part of the slide, but Bayside is, is kind of underwater even under the intermediate scenario. Um, but if we Again, don't take action. We see the extreme scenario, a significant portion of the areas of Portland and South Portland that we you know, rely on for you know, economic activity and for recreation um, and, you know, just, you know, important parts of our community are, are underwater and people will certainly have to leave those areas. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And we know there's other impacts. You know, there's a picture from a heavy, heavy rain we had in 2015. We had over six inches of rain in just several hours, and many people remember, I think, cars floating past Whole Foods. Uh, and we expect to see a lot more of these types of uh, heavy rain events in the future. And Bayside particularly is vulnerable because it's kind of where all the water in the city kind of rolls down to. And if there's 
if this happens at high tide, all the storm drains are full and water has nowhere to go. So we need to be prepared for these types of things. We also know that heat, rising heat, is going to be a significant problem for us. We've seen over the past um, past decade, past century, I should say, um, the average temperature in Maine has gone up three degrees. By 2050, we anticipate it's going to go up another three degrees. And that's even if we, that's with, that's with um, you know, carbon already built into our atmosphere. We'll see three degrees Fahrenheit increase by 2050. So what that means is that we're going to see more and more hot days. Um, we'll see more people challenged by heat stroke. Uh, it will be difficult to work outside or recreate outside. And people will need to have cooling centers and will need to have their homes air conditioned. As Mainers, many of our homes are not air conditioned. So that's something that's going to be a challenge. And that leads to you know, a public health issue. Um, we need to be concerned about how do we make sure that vulnerable populations um, are able to access uh, cooling centers, um, how you know, we, heat exacerbates a lot of health problems. So people have respiratory illnesses um, or you know, circulatory diseases or asthma, uh, heat exacerbates those. Um, so that's going to be a problem as well. And uh, we also know that um, the impact of climate change is significant around the world. More, you know, Portland, we're relatively fortunate with the impacts on our climate are much less severe than what we see in other parts of the world in, you know, India, heat waves, central, you know, Middle East heat waves, and a lot of climate impacts in uh, South America and Africa. In fact, Central Africa is one of the most um, impacted um, places in the world right now for climate change. And you know, we're already seeing people fleeing um, their homes that, you know, because of impacts of climate change um, that cause, you know, civil strife, uh, crop failures, um, and a variety of other problems that uh, make it untenable for people to stay where they are. So people will be moving around the world. And you know, we're already seeing in Portland that you know, people you know, from other parts of the world are coming, you know, coming to our, our city. And we, you know, we need to learn how to welcome and, and accommodate and our new neighbors who are having to leave where they came from. And just for example, so by 2050, um, again, Africa we mentioned is severely impacted. Um, 86 million people um, could be refugees um, by 2050. In Central Asia, which is, um, South Asia, sorry, which is, you know, very vulnerable to flooding um, from, um, from sea level rise, but it was also from increasingly powerful storms. In fact, we just had, they just experienced um, uh, Typhoon um, Amphan that was devastating for Bangladesh. Um, and Latin America certainly is also um, heavily impacted with uh, droughts and, um, and rising temperatures. So we need to be prepared uh, for people on the move. And, you know, that kind of builds into our vision statement. Is this my talking now? Or are you talking, Julie? No, I, I, I let Troy give you all the bad news and now I'm going to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thanks, Troy. Um, given all of that context and what we know are the important changes that we need to, to make, uh, we got together um, and developed uh, this vision for our, our climate action plan. Um, and I always like to read it at every opportunity. Together, Portland and South Portland work to be inclusive, vibrant communities that provide opportunities for residents and businesses to thrive in a changing climate. So we can, we can look at, at climate change as, um, as, as a sort of a, a, a big looming um, threat that it is. And we can also look at what opportunities um, does it have to present to us to do um, to change the way that we do business? You know, we know that everyone will be affected by climate change, some more immediately and more dramatically than others. Um, and, and, and therefore, it's important to us that um, even though our plan focuses on energy and buildings and infrastructure, that we keep the focus that this is a people and community based plan. With that in mind, we made our, the development of our, our climate action plan um, an 18 month process on purpose so that we could engage as many people as possible. Um, you know, the, the, the technical solutions are, are there and we probably could have sat down and developed a written amount um, with, you know, several smart people on advisory committees um, in a week or two. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this is a type of plan that everyone sees as their plan 
in order to make their community, our communities um, stronger. We did an enormous, we've done an enormous amount of education and outreach. Um, and we, we really wanted to get um, beyond the standard uh, municipal um, public meeting approach um, and, and get creative. So our engagement has included um, a, a fantastic website, um, email updates, interns, you'll see a picture of them there um, that we called our street team to go out and engage people at events where they are. Uh, we've done um, three surveys. The first um, was a benchmark of uh, where people were at, what their thoughts and concerns are, what actions they've taken. The second survey covered um, what their barriers to taking additional action were. And the third survey, which um, we've just closed, um, we had a fantastic response on was about um, uh, people weighing in on the strategies that some of the strategies that we are proposing in our plan. Um, we've done tons of presentations, uh, not yet, we've done tons of presentations. Uh, we wanted this to be accessible, so we translated our information into three different languages. We've done a lunch and learn series to break down bits of the information and deliver it to people. And of course, we've done many, many public events. Thank you, Troy. Next okay. slide. Um, that's okay. I went on a bit about the um, engagement, but it's just was it's so important to us. We view this as um, a, a comprehensive plan for the city, um, or at least a comprehensive climate plan that will speak to the comprehensive plan. So our plan focuses on four key areas um, because these are the main sources of emissions um, um, in our cities: buildings and energy use, transportation and land use, waste reduction, and climate resilience. In order to um, make progress on those four areas and really figure out what types of uh, emissions we needed to reduce and what strategies we needed to take, we did two sort of preliminary studies. One was a vulnerability assessment. What are the key vulnerabilities that our cities are facing? Um, and it is a fantastic 180 page report. Um, and the when what we did was boil down the, the top 10 um, vulnerabilities that our cities are facing, which you see here now. And I'm not going to go over them in detail, but this really has um, laid the uh, foundation for a lot of um, the resilience strategies that we're exploring. The second um, study that we did was um, an overall, next slide please, an overall greenhouse gas emissions um, inventory for both cities, um, for, for all emissions from municipal, residential, commercial, and industrial. And um, what this um, inventory has told us is that um, over 66% of our emissions come from the building sector and about 32 to 35% come from transportation. You'll see that only two or 3% of our emissions come from waste, um, but really this captures only the back end of, of the waste. So when, um, when you throw something away and it gets burned into the waste to energy facility, that's what this captures. And this is the whole other part of the story about um, how I, um, items are being mined, processed, sold, transported, used, and then disposed of. So while this is only a small percentage, it still plays a big role in our climate action plan. Um, waste is also a, a really good way to approach people because it's something that people deal with and are familiar with um, every single day. So uh, with our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, we, um, we looked at um, the types of fuels that are being used and how we can transition to renewable energy, use less energy um, and electrify our um, uh, transportation and building sectors. Next slide. As I said, we made this an 18 month process. Um, and uh, this used to look a little bit different before COVID. I really, really expanded out the, the red circle um, because our, our plan has gotten stretched out. We are in the tail end of prioritizing solutions for action and, and starting to really um, develop the plan for final review. Um, and we expect, um, this to happen over the summer and to get this in front of our city councils um, in early September. Probably could have been August, but nobody, nobody's around in August even with COVID. So we decided to stick with um, September to, to bring it forward to our councils. Although I think in 
July, we are going to have um, a workshop to pre present our first draft to our city councilors. And if they have any input, then the, the, they will have some time and we will have some time to go back. And so the final plan is expected to be launched in September. Oh, so one of the important things we did with our greenhouse gas inventory is to identify, um, we saw the graph that showed, um, you know, which, you know, which sectors of our economy um, in our community produce uh, the most greenhouse gas emissions. So we needed to look at what types of policies do we need to implement in order to um, reach the goal 80% reduction by 2050. So you can see on the top of the wedge, the, you can, if that's kind of business as usual, if we continue and, and don't take actions, we'll continue to see an increase of emissions in our communities. But if we implement different policies, um, we can start taking a bite out of the wedge and flatten the curve, so to speak, on climate emissions. Um, there's some things that have to happen at a state and federal level, uh, the top one being you know, fuel economy standards. Um, we're hoping, well, I know that, that the current administration is trying to roll back fuel economy standards, but um, you know, we need to advocate that they continue to improve so people with um, internal combustion engines use less, uh, less gasoline and diesel fuel. And um, the next large red section is actually a state policy that was implemented last year. It's the Renewable Portfolio Standard enacted by Governor Mills and the legislature that calls for 100% um, clean electricity in the main grid by 2050 and 80% and uh, clean, uh, clean by 2030, which is an impressive and one of the most aggressive goals in the country. But you can see what an important role that plays um, in helping us achieve our goals. And uh, the building sectors um, are kind of the next phase. You can see the blue stripe in the middle, the darker blue and the, and the, and the lighter blue are a big significant part of our, part of our wedge. Um, so we need to um, look at new policies. So the new building, new construction can be on a pathway to net zero uh, um, energy. But we also, and more dramatically, need to take actions to weatherize um, existing buildings. Portland and South Portland have old building stocks. Um, they're old and inefficient, heated by oil and natural gas. So how do we take a bite out of that, you know, that blue wedge, the thick part, um, to get existing buildings to be more energy efficient? Again, uh, moving, you know, the governor's mission to have 100,000 new heat pumps in five years is a great step in the right direction, but what else do we do? What kind of programs and incentives can we provide um, building owners to, um, to take action? And we also need to certainly look at, um, you know, making, um, you know, EVs, transforming our, um, our uh, transportation fleets to uh, electric vehicles. And also, how do we get people out of cars? How do we incentivize and encourage people to walk, uh, ride transit, and take bicycles? That's and transportation is about 30% of our, uh, our emissions. And so you can see that uh, there's a lot of work we have to do um, in pretty much every sector of our economy in order to reach our goals. Um, you know, for instance, um, we have some targets we need to reach. Again, new buildings are super important. Um, we'd like to see, you know, 30 million square feet of new or renovated net zero energy buildings across um, both cities. Um, we need to reduce energy use in our in our um, commercial buildings and industrial buildings. Um, how do we um, decarbonize um, heating? So ground source and air source heat pumps, um, and then you know replacing, moving away from fossil fuels, natural gas, and um, and oil. And again, transitioning uh, the RPS with 100% renewable energy by 2050 and getting EVs on the road in a much bigger way than they currently are. Um, we need to, right now, only, you know, 87% of the people who are driving, uh, moving around the cities of Portland, South Portland are in single occupancy cars. We need to get that down to 60%. Uh, we need to look at how can we um, provide shore power for, um, for ships that are coming into our ports. Um, we need to make sure that our public transportation system is powered by electric energy by 2040. And again, massive penetration of EVs um, into, uh, into the transportation sector. And Julie mentioned um, waste reduction is really key. Not so much that it moves the needle on 
our emissions, but um, as a sector, um, consumer goods, transportation, production are really a huge place and people can make a huge difference in, in by reducing their waste and recycling as much as they can. So that's gonna be a key part of our, our program as well. And I think that this, we're wrapping up. Um, we're really excited that we had an opportunity to, uh, to present this to you. We're really excited to have any questions that you might have about the plan or about the planning process um, going forward. I just, I just want to add one more thought. Yeah. Um, I know that um, there was just a, a, a webinar about the um, main climate action plan and um, we are definitely um, linking our climate action plan to the main climate action plan. We've had um, a number of conversations with the, the governor's um, energy office and the office of policy innovation in the future. Um, and uh, we're participating on um, the energy working group. And um, lastly, we've pulled out, um, just like Troy mentioned in the wedge analysis that the uh, renewable portfolio standard is, is, um, is really key. We've pulled out five municipal energy priorities that um, that we need state level authorization or action on in order for us to help meet our goals and, and we'll be um, putting those through our council this summer and delivering those to the main um, uh, climate council. Thank you Troy and Julie. Um, I really appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing what you've been doing. Uh, you all just heard about the amazing planning work being done in Portland and South Portland to create a strong climate action plan. And Troy, if you would go on to the uh, the next slide, that'd be great. For... I've got to open up your slides again, sorry. The other one. Yep. Uh, we're asking you all today to sign a petition urging the Maine Climate Council to also adopt a strong climate action plan. And that plan must include recommendations that ensure reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And the plan also must include recommendations for the state to aid communities like Portland, South Portland, and communities all over the state to adapt to the serious and costly changes to be wrought by the climate crisis and to build a clean energy economy for all Maine people. And MCV is serving on several of the Climate Council's working groups and along with partners across the state, we're using those roles to make Mainers voices heard in this process. And so the Climate Meeting Council meetings are public and there is time for public comments at the end of those meetings. And the next Climate Council meetings are from 9 to 12.30 p.m. on June 17th and 18th. So we hope you take time out of your schedules and, and join and, and hear about the great work that's being done uh, at the Maine Climate Council. We've already gotten some great questions from you all. And a reminder, if you have any questions you wanna ask, please message me using the chat. Uh, but to start off, uh, we had a question from a, 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 a person on today that wanted to know about the public engagement more. What, what challenges did you run into with public engagement? What was surprising and what feedback was surprising from different stakeholders? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll take a first stab at that. Um, so um, we really wanted this to be not just our standard um, preaching to the choir outreach plan. And I tell the, you know, we have a lot of people who are really engaged, and I remember having a conversation with some members of our Sierra Club group um, that's very active. And I, you know, I told them like, "Look, we could have our." And they were a little frustrated with some of the, um, you know, we kind of started at the beginning with some basics earlier on in the process, and they were a little concerned that the level of, of wasn't as high as they might have liked it to be at the beginning. And we have to remind them that you know we could do our climate engagement meetings at two o'clock in the morning on Sunday and. And they would come and be part of it. We need to meet more people where they are, um, which I think was, I think we were relatively successful in doing that. Um, you know, we had, you know, the street team, we had the surveys and, um, and actually I think some of the online workshops we did at the end were the most effective at reaching out to more people because we did them at off hours. We did some at eight o'clock in the evening. We did some at lunchtime and some at dinner time. And so we, we had people who, certainly weren't the choir um, and people who didn't, you know, we had one uh, attendee who you know, had said, you know, she said, I didn't know anything about this. I really thought, think it's important. I want to learn. So she and her family were like, around her iPhone uh, watching our presentation and participating in the conversation. So that was, that was, we thought that was really successful. Uh, I think maybe we, we really, really wanted to try to reach, um, you know, into all the diversity of the cities. Um, and so we, developed, you know, we, we met with 
you know, Portland Housing and, and folks in Red Bank and and we you know reached out to um, you know to a lot of the social service agencies um, and and tried to engage them as much as we could. But I think you know that we we feel like that you know we weren't as successful as we would have liked to have been um, in that. And I think part of it's you know because you know people working in public you know public service areas and are you know, pretty tasked with you know keeping you know their programs going. And you know I think we're going to continue to work hard in that area. Um, I don't know if you want to add on that, Julie. Um. I do. I mean, I think I, I agree with everything you said. I, I, I'd say, yes, the biggest challenge was um, we, we wrote equity into our plan from the RFP. We, we sat, we, we wrote a whole paragraph about how we want to make sure that our climate action and adaptation plan um, has equity running through, a, has, is, is built through an equity lens. Um, and I think we had, we did have a really hard time um, so we so we identify different communities um, that aren't typically represented and tried to make sure that we um, got participation from those communities and it was hard it's really hard people are super challenged um, for their attention um, and for um, participating in things and I think we made good progress I think we still have a lot of work to do and just because our plan comes out doesn't mean we stop there it means we keep going um, I do want to say the the thing that I was most surprised about was um, how big the choir is getting. Um, I uh, we printed out our last survey because some people like to take it online and some people like to take it um, in paper, and it was 21 pages. And I went to the um, before COVID happened. I went to the um, to the um, voting uh, uh, polling places so where people go to vote. And I stood and I and I asked people um, if they wanted to uh, to fill out a survey, um, and but but I didn't like shove it at them and say, "Do you want to fill out a survey?" I held it back, and they said, "Well, I, I don't know. what's it about?" And I told them it's about our climate action plan and the the, the um, initiative we're proposing. And almost every single person, except for maybe two, are like, "Absolutely, I'm really excited to learn about what's going on. I'm really interested in this." And, and they took the 21 page survey um, and I gave them a, an envelope to mail it back and um, many of them mailed it back. And um, so I think there's a lot of support for this and I'm really happy about that. Awesome. We had a great question about kind of the, the process and, and the difficulties you ran into. So did developing a joint plan across the two municipalities pose any specific challenges? And if so, how were those challenges addressed? Um, well, I mean, I'll start with this. I'll start with, with, with just how easy it's been and the similarities because um, Troy, it's not the first time Troy and I have worked together. Our city councilors um, are similarly um, um, supportive of climate action. They're really supportive of us working together. It makes sense to do it on a regional um, level because of the very nature of climate, because of our shared geography um, and economies. Um, and so Troy and I um, and, and the folks that work with us really have learned how to work together. Um, and we, we've spent a lot of time together on this drinking coffee and um, figuring out how to um, develop the strategies. And, and, and you'll see that some of them, so one climate action plan, but each city will have its own strategies because like the solar landfill projects that we um, did together exactly the same, uh, Portland had had this um, different work to do, and we had a little bit different work to do, but the same goal and the same um, time frame for moving forward to get there. And so I think we've really spent a lot of time on um, making sure that there's room enough for both cities to um, to have this cater to both cities. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, because you know, we're neighbors and we have a lot of similarities, but we definitely have some differences. But the plan is stronger. If it's one plan and and references actions that each city does to support the work of the other, and I think one of the things that's been really key in making it successful is that there's a really high level of trust. Um, you know, other other communities have you know been really curious about our process and they're like, oh, we want to see your MOU and all the legal documents that um, you guys created to have this partnership, and we basically the only reference the only legal part was in the contract for the consultant is that we split the cost of the 
of paying the consultants. The rest is all handshakes and you know and real partnership. And I think mean, that's a great model too. It's you know it's not competitive. It's it's you know we're building, working together, and being collaborative and working in the best interests of our communities. We had a question about um, some of the advocacy for, is there going to be advocacy for an ordinance to ban fossil fuels for new construction and major renovations? Is that something you foresee? Well, I mean, if you, someone, maybe someone, maybe someone who asked the question took the survey number three, because there's a question about that. And, and we're not sure yet. I mean, part of it's going to depend on what the, you know, the councils want to do. And, you know, certainly, we need to electrify the economy, electrify heating and cooling, and, and to uh, to really achieve the goals. So, um, so whether that happens by ordinance or by just natural progression, I guess is, remains to be seen. Um, but you know, looking at the the wedge analysis, you can see that um, to meet our goals, moving away from all forms of fossil fuel as much as possible will be important. And you know, in the industrial sector. Um, where there's industrial process that require very high temperatures, electrification is going to be really challenging. Um, so that might be harder to accomplish. But um, you know there is technology to run the you know commercial a lot of commercial buildings and residential homes with, with electricity. So we'll see. We we do know that that we have to take bold action. We absolutely know that, um, and we do know that. Um, so there's a question about specifically banning natural gas in, in, in new construction or banning natural gas um, hookups. And, um, and we know that natural gas has been seen as sort of the transition fuel, but the more infrastructure that we build for it, the, the less it is a transition fuel. And so our, um, our goal is to say, we need to get beyond this notion of the cleaner fossil fuel um, towards electrification and actually uh, reducing emissions through renewable energy. And so we're, I think what, what helps us, what helps me work with Troy really well is that both of us are extremely practical in how we think about and how we propose and introduce really bold, shocking new ideas. And so, um, so at some point there is going to be um, something that we introduce that curtails the use of fossil fuels in buildings. Um, and whether and how we introduce that is going to be, um, we're still batting that around. It, it could be um, no new natural gas in um, new uh, commercial and um, residential buildings. It could be no new hookups. It could be um, whatever it is, we're still batting that around with our council and with our um, planning and other staff. And so um, we're figuring out how to phase it in. We had uh, a question about COVID and uh, how has COVID impacted resiliency planning for both communities, uh, either communications, vulnerable neighborhoods, or support for those that need it the most? Um, so yeah, I think um, it's it certainly challenged us. And it would just like on the just in our process, we had to, you know retool and do engagement online but i think it's um the crisis is really showing you know that you know people in our community are you know are vulnerable to shocks and it's kind of a i think it's you know we can th think about it in terms of um showing some areas that we need to make sure we are that we have resilience like food making sure that uh people have access to food and you know one of the struggles that we've seen in portland is you know, there's people who are experiencing homelessness and how do we help provide them places where they can get care, where people can, you know, be, where they can do a quarantine if they need to and be safe and secure. Um, and those are issues that, you know, it could be a natural disaster or it could be a heat wave. Those are things that we're just going to see amplified uh, in the future. So it's some, in some ways, I think it's providing us a real lesson in things that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to in terms of resilience, making sure supply chains are strong. And one of the things in the vulnerability assessment noted that, you know, food is going to be, you know, potentially disrupted, you know, with climate change because of maybe transportation is disrupted or supply chains are disrupted. And how do we make sure that we keep um, a stock of, of healthy 
you know, foods for our neighbors in our community. So how, maybe that suggests a stronger local agriculture section, sector in Maine. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it's just in some ways a trial run for a future future problems. Yeah, worst worst trial one run, worst study ever. The, the fact yeah. that best, best results for information, worst study ever. Um, I, I I would just second that it is bringing up the need for us to to start working on adaptation and resilience right now. That is something that people sort of say, well, can't we put that off into the future because it's not going to happen right now? But it's really bring, bringing it to the fore. One thing, um, oh, just, I just would like to add a little bit to that because I think one thing, oh, the truck is going by. Um, a lot of people in the community have really banded together. Uh, I know in like some some parts of the you know immigrant community, people have you know groups have banded together to make sure their neighbors were had food. So I think that's you know that's the important part of of resilience is how does the community support each other? How do we have social resilience? And that's something I think that we're learning through COVID too. Is you know we're seeing the huge uh, outreach to support our local businesses and restaurants um, as they you know are suffering from you know lock, lock, being not being able to do their business. Um, and there's a real community spirit about trying to support to support uh, our restaurant sector and the business sector. And that's what we need: community organization, community resilience, and, and social resilience. Mm -hmm. I think. Related to that, but um, maybe too early to tell, but uh, Pat was wondering about have there been any changes or tweaks to the plan as a result of, you know, what we're seeing as behavioral changes and thinking, you know, Twitter is no longer going to send people back to the office potentially. Are we seeing those kind of changes in Portland and South Portland and is that already impacting the planning that, that you're doing? Uh, Troy, yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, good. I don't know that it is as it has changed our strategies per se. Um, it definitely, um, you know, uh, um, reducing vehicle miles traveled has, has has always been a strategy. So it so it sort of works together for it. Um, I so I can't say we've definitely done our outreach differently and our, and and changing all of that and how we expect to do things and and maybe run some programs, but not the strategies per se. It's, it's unfortunately aiding in the need for these strategies and just in the implementation of them. And I think one of the things that I mean, I'm a little concerned about is, you know, you saw that in the transportation sector, we need to really get people out of single occupancy cars um, in order to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. And, you know, I th you know we've seen, you know, transit nationally really take a hit as people are concerned about riding uh, on buses and subways and how you know how soon will people feel comfortable um, returning to transit um, as a way to get around the community um, will people you know want to ride their bikes more or are people just going to say well i'm just going to ride my car because i feel safer that way i think that's something we really need to think about and see if that's going to really impact um, the strategies we want to employ moving forward. We had a lot of questions with a parking lot component, but I have one that I think I can I can meld them together, which is we know that legis the legislator voted last year to update the Maine Uniform Building Energy Code version that Maine construction should follow. What building code is currently being used for new development in Portland? For example, new hotels and businesses in Commercial Street and the Eastern Front Waterfront and kind of associated with that, which is, are there areas like the Whole Foods parking lot areas that are just too close to sea level and, and are problematic and we should rethink? Um, so Maine has a uniform building code. So the building code that you know we've been using in Portland and South Portland and every other town is, um, you know, for the energy code, it's 2009 of IECC. Um, the legislature upgraded that to 20, the 2015 IECC. Um, so the, the code board is currently working on that. Um, They're preparing to have a vote to adopt it um, before COVID. And they, as far as I know, haven't had an opportunity to reconvene. Um, so we're looking forward to the, because you know, the, the 2015 code is much more 
aggressive on energy conservation than the 20, 20, 2009 code. So it's a great step in the right direction. Um, they also, um, the legislature also authorized or asked the code board to develop a voluntary stretch code for that municipalities could adopt if they want to. And that's not that created yet. Again, COVID has kind of shut down that whole process. Um, but we'll certainly, it's something that, um, you know, our councils um, advocated at the legislature in favor of the bill to, you know, to allow a stretch code. Um, we'll see what that looks like, and I'm sure we'll participate in forming it. Um, with, on the Portland side also, we've already started looking at um, what we're calling a climate resilience overlay zone. It's been to the planning board a couple times. Um, the idea about how would we how would we um, be able to regulate um, construction and development in areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise? Um, so we're, you know, thinking of, again, it's still much a work in progress. You know, do we create incentives to, um, for developers who want to build in vulnerable areas to make more resilient buildings? Um, you know, because, you know, adding a lot of features to be resilient, you know, would you know, cost more money and or reduce the available space people have, they have to uh, monetize their development. So what's the best approach? You know, incentives or, you know, regulation, just, re you know, restrictions or a combination of two. And so that's, there's converse, there's sections of the climate action plan that will kind of address that some more, but it is something we're thinking about. And, you know, in the past, up until now, we, you know, the planners um, haven't had all the tools in their toolbox to maybe do everything they might have liked to do, um, but we're working on those. Julia, I think this is kind of for you, but, but Troy as well. Uh, the consumer economy and retail sector is going to be significantly reduced due to COVID since retail is a huge presence in South Portland, thinking the main mall. Have you taken this into account in, the, in kind of an updated plan or, or what is the impact of that for you? Again, parking lots involved here as well. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I, I think that, that COVID might be sh sharpening this issue, but this was an issue that existed b before COVID hit. Um, I know that South Portland has been working on a, um, a transit-oriented development plan for the main mall area um, and is working with our, um, our assistant city manager and economic development director are working with, um, with the mall and neighboring properties um, to figure out um, what the future might look like there. And, you know, in Portland, it will be, you know, certainly where, you know, we have a lot of tourism and the old port is, you know, bars and restaurants and, and stores where people, you know, come together. And it's, you know, the whole retail sector and the restaurant sector has been really whacked hard by COVID. So, um, you know, the city budget's been, you know, really hit hard as well because that's you know a big part of the revenue for the city so it'll be you know we haven't you know made changes in the plan yet it's really too early um but it'll be i think it's safe to say it will be a different world in some ways than what we had going into it so we'll have to kind of retool yeah and and just to follow up um you know if people are curious about sort of the development or redevelopment of the main mall area our Climate action plan is it's going to sort of lay the foundation. It's going to develop maybe some um, climate overlay uh, zoning um, areas and what that might look like. Um, and then, but it doesn't go specifically throughout the city and say, here's what should be here or, or how things should be replaced or upgraded. So it'll give that guidance for as they move forward and figure out how they want to re redevelop. Okay. What do you all expect to see? What, what do you all expect to be the most controversial recommendations or, or kind of what's the, the biggest swing for you all? And what help do you need from everybody on the call for this work? What, what can people do for you? So I think um, some of the things that might be the most controversial is, you know, we, you know, we kind of touched on it earlier is like, transitioning all fuel sources to re total renewables. Um, that would take a lot of change, a lot of work um, to do things differently, to heat our homes differently, to heat our, heat our businesses differently. So 
Um, but I think that's something that people will get will get their attention. I know certainly having internal discussions, it's like, how do you do that in a fair way, in a cost effective way? Um, so I think there'll be a lot about that. Um, and in terms of what do we need from people, I think, you know, it's, you know, this is a public process and uh, it'll be really important for um, people who live in Portland and South Portland to let the, their counselors know their opinion on different measures on the plan as a whole uh, to just weigh in and be part of and participate in the process to, uh, so, you know, our elected officials know where everybody stands and provide their, their input. Yeah, I think that the things will, I, th I think it depends on how we introduce things, which we're still settling out in our strategies. Um, if something is a ban or done through incentives or done through zoning amendments. Um, so I think, I think the way we introduce things is going to be um, maybe um, more controversial for some people, uh, like Troy mentioned. So I think those might be the sticking points for, for how things get adopted and accepted. I think the hardest part of this plan to me is going to be, how do we look at facilitating a massive mood shift, getting people out of their single use vehicles and into shared vehicles, transit, walking, biking, all of that more, um, because that's a specific cultural change. Um, so up front, maybe some resistance on how we introduce things, um, but overall, maybe um, changing people's behavior around their single use vehicles might be the most difficult. Um, and I agree with Troy, just letting it, letting counselors know what works. So this whole plan needs to be sustainable. Uh, we're trying to really balance. Um, I think when you when you really sh introduce too many shocks into 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 the system, we know we need to disrupt our energy system and change it to renewable energy to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think the balance is figuring out how do we introduce things that are going to be bold, but palatable and practical um, to implement. And so Thank we need you. to make sure that we're going along those lines. Fabulous. Thank you both for joining. Uh, Troy, if you wanna to go to the next slide. I know some others put some questions in and we're gonna send those questions to Julie and Troy and uh, perhaps we'll have an opportunity to uh, follow up with some of you with questions very specific questions. And thank you all for submitting such great questions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just wanna say thank you all for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. We are gonna email you a brief survey for those that have joined for previous Lunch and Learns. You, you know the routine. Uh, and that'll come later this afternoon. And we really do welcome your feedback. So please take a few moments to fill it out. I also wanna let you know that I am the person that works to schedule these Lunch and Learns. So if there's a topic you really wanna know more about, my email is will at mainconservation.org and I would love to talk to you about programming for this summer. Um, if you enjoyed this event, I encourage you to join for our future, future Lunch and Learns. We're here every Friday from 12 to 1 p.m. Next Friday, June 5th, Dr. Carl Kreutz from the University of Maine at Orono will present on everything you need to know about climate change and might have been afraid to ask each other. So please look for an email early next week announcing the rest of our June Lunch and Learns. And uh, in that email, we'll include a registration for next week's Lunch and Learn. Thank you all again for joining and, and have a wonderful day and be safe. Thanks for having us, Will. Thank you.